welcome everyone coming through and just as you're coming in i appreciate your a lot of you coming from the previous session uh, i'm just going to share a quick poll and the poll is what springs to mind when you hear ai uh, so that should be in the chat now feel free to drop a word in we'll create a nice little word cloud uh, alternatively if this isn't working for you then please use the chat and tell us what word or words spring to mind when you hear ai we'll be starting shortly we'll just give people 90 seconds or so to enter the room Terminator, yes, our first Terminator. 100%, if the Terminator were real, it would be kind of built upon machine learning. Hello and welcome everyone again. Um, just got a quick poll here for you in the chat. If you can tell us what word or words bring to mind when you hear AI, and we'll be starting shortly. We'll just let as many people as possible enter the room. Um, I asked ChatGPT just a minute ago, actually, how long should I wait at the start of a meeting for people to enter? And it suggested kind of five to ten minutes. We're not going to do that. That's far far too many uh, too many minutes. Far too much of the time eating up. So uh, we'll wait another 30 seconds or so and then we'll get started so what have we got so far we've got a lot of uh, the mention of automation which is fantastic efficient automation yes yeah, good to see a, a little statistics in there as well keep them coming Okay, fantastic. So that's been three minutes, actually. So let's actually get started. And shut that down and let's go. Right, so first of all, again, very welcome for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed the morning sessions you've been able to get to so far. Um, what I'm gonna do just before we start, uh, a little bit of a kind of, um, uh, housekeeping rules here we are recording this meeting uh, we'll be asking for your views throughout and um, we've got a whiteboard set up in order for you to be able to kind of give us your views but please feel free to use the chat as well uh, any and all comments are really fantastic to hear and this session in particular really wants to gather your views on the subject we're going to be talking about there'll be periods throughout where we'll be stopping and asking you to kind of submit your comments on the whiteboard and um, but do use the chat throughout Right, before I begin, I'm going to hand you over to Ben Unsworth, who's the Director of Service Transformation here at Essex County Council, to give us a bit of a scene setter for the next hour. Super, thanks Stephen. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I won't be scene setting for the whole of that hour, I'll just get us kicked off at the top here. So Stephen says, I, I look after service transformation here at ECC, um, and that includes uh, a team of folks who uh, work uh, a lot in the kind of digital services space. So uh, as you can imagine, we've got quite a vested interest in in the development uh, that have been happening around around artificial intelligence. Um, I just wanted to very briefly reflect on um, what has actually been quite a long hype cycle for artificial intelligence. Um, so when Stephen and I and other colleagues were kind of preparing for some of these sessions and, and sessions a bit like this, when we kind of dig through the research, you kind of end up back in the 1950s, um, which is where the, the kind of the birth of this science really started and, and you can read the quote for yourselves but it's, it's pretty much saying um, that if you can kind of document the the processes that, that uh, something needs to go through you can probably tell a machine how to simulate it um, and that was one of their kind of opening definitions around around artificial intelligence um, as you know uh, it's been a fairly long and slow burn uh, but that's really really accelerated over recent decades and more recently kind of recent years and months um, and, and partly because of uh, the kind of growth in, in processing power and the kind of uh, the use of, of things like cloud computing and, and of many and various sciences around that, which which folks will talk about in a bit more detail. Um, but before we kind of get into the, I guess, the meat of the subject, it was just reflecting a little bit on where we're at in that hype cycle. And we had a fascinating chat with folks from Gartner very recently at the council, and I, they used a lovely uh, analogy of, of, uh, of a relationship. Um, and how actually our kind of uh, relationship to AI is a bit like those really early days of a new relationship where everybody's kind of super into each other and we're, we're really kind of just seeing all the good in each other. And that maybe, just maybe, we're starting to tip over the top of that curve, um, particularly with things like generative AI, 
and realize that maybe, you know, the other person in this relationship, you know, they stack the dishwasher in unorthodox ways and maybe they leave tea bags in the sink, that kind of stuff. So we're possibly just starting to see. Um, and again, this is I'd love opinions in the chat as we go through and in uh, the kind of breakout sessions. Um, but for where people think we're at in, in this kind of this this tipping point as we're starting to explore the use of some of these technologies in, in our day to day organizations. Um, so, yeah, super exciting time. Loads to discuss. Um, we want to kind of make the most of this technology, use it in super responsible ways as well. So we're, we're going to kind of explore a bunch of different scenarios with you uh, and kind of really, I guess, test our, our kind of appetite and thinking around how we might start to apply some of this stuff in our context. Uh, that's it for me. And you'll hear a bit more from me at the end. Lovely. Thank you very much. And, and like Ben mentioned there, there'll be opportunities where we'll find some kind of structured questions or way. Uh, but throughout any kind of comment you may have, drop it in the chat function here. And um, what I've done in the past is then kind of take that out and stick it through some uh, language processing uh, tool to come out with something quite uh, spectacular. So, um, yeah, the, the more we can talk, the better those outputs will be. Um, uh, so first of all, I just want to thank Ben very much for that intro. Um, I guess across the morning sessions, we've had some fantastic speakers. Everyone's been very kind of professional and slick. Um, this is a bit of a pre-warning. Um, my brand is more what I like to call structured chaos. Uh, so the next 45 minutes might be a little bit different, uh, but variety is always good. And that is actually what this session is all about, that kind of varied opinions uh, from different people. Uh, first up, my name is Stephen Simkin, and I am Data Science Fellow at Essex County Council. So for nearly 20 years, I've worked in analytics and research teams in government. And in those 20 years, I've been using a lot of the methods that would sit under the bonnet of the AI products that we've been hearing more and more about, particularly in the last year. So kind of 20 years of doing things like regression analysis and cluster analysis and forecasting and language processing. And, and in that time, no one really batted an eyelid. There was like kind of casual interest, but uh, not to the degree we, we're hearing about today. So suddenly all of those methods, they're getting this kind of new branding of machine learning algorithms, and they're under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. Uh, and alongside that, kind of coupled with the release of things like ChatGPT version four last year and other AI tools that really captured the imagination, um, round about this time last year, in fact, there was this kind of almost overnight uh, super interest in everything, in, in a lot of uh, our world of data professionals. And I'd say this interest is really, really welcome. Um, it's resulting in kind of fresh eyes, exploring some exciting opportunities, but it's also ensuring that there's increased transparency and scrutiny. And it's a combination of those two lenses, which are really, really important. And today, collectively, we're going to be both of those. Or if you actually feel very strongly on one side, that's completely fine too. Uh, the main caveat today is that I want to hear the very specific details of what you like about AI and AI technologies, or what worries you about AI and AI technologies. And again, it's that detail. Um, so the aim, we're going to have a look at some of AI's kind of poster boys, and we're going to dissect them to their bare bones. And through having this conversation, we're about to start, kind of focusing on specific components that either excite or concern us, what we should start to get is a good picture of some immediate opportunities where we might use effectively. Uh, plus, we'll highlight some of those areas where we think might may require more careful consideration. Um, so you're welcome to share a few throughout. It's quite tricky to kind of manage kind of these vulnerable people. Uh, so we'll be using a whiteboard at kind of three or four different stages to gather your views. Uh, but again, use your chat uh, as much as you'd like to. Uh, I want a kind of diverse and eclectic collection of views. Um, we've done this exercise once before, and I have to say that hearing from people uh, from a kind of spectrum of different roles made it probably the most useful and productive conversation uh, certainly I've ever had or been involved in around about AI. Um, and it made it kind of hugely uh, apparent to me that when talking about things like AI, it shouldn't just be a conversation between leaders. Um, everyone needs to be involved because it's kind of becoming one of those almost uh, revolutionary developments of our time. Right, so some of you might have come from the session before, which would have covered some of the basics of what is AI, so I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, I'm kind of assuming you have a, a basic understanding, uh, but also, if not, within this exercise, it doesn't really matter if you have zero understanding of the mechanics under the bonnet. Um, but here is a bit of a summary on a page. Um, a lot of these things under the bonnet are 
pretty much more advanced versions of some statistical simple approaches that have existed for, for years, for decades even. Uh, albeit in recent times, they've been almost optimized as a result of increased volume of the data being generated on a, on a daily basis and also uh, significant advances in technology make this a lot more possible to do on a large kind of scale. Um, so right at the top there, we've got robotics and engineering. Beneath that, we've got machine learning. You heard a bit about that earlier, but machine learning algorithms have been pretty mainstream for quite a while and you will use them all the time. So kind of things like Google searches, Netflix recommendations, Facebook sponsored content, uh, chatbots, things like that. Uh, we also heard a bit earlier about uh, visual imagery recognition. Again, that has existed for quite a long time. Text-to-speech translation, language comprehension, and so on. Um, just quickly going to draw your attention to the bottom part here, this uh, robotic process of automation. Um, there's been so many efficiencies have been made in the last decade through robotic process automation. This is the kind of less sexy but incredibly important process of automating simple, uh, usually rules-based or logic-based tasks, um, mostly for efficiency savings and optimization. Um, not every single decision is complicated and not every action requires a human to trigger, and that's where this comes into its own. So something like uh, credit card applications, for example, 99% uh, of cases don't really need human oversight. It's based on a few inputs and checks and rules and logic that will determine whether or not an application is successful. So if this and this, then yes, issue credit card. Um, there'll be masses of these types of process across our organizations where robotic process automation can help. Um, still very much underpinned by huge volumes of analysis, um, but just kind of deployed in a, in a safe environment. Um, and quite often AI is never really a binary choice. It's not as simple as saying like, yes, we should use it or no, we shouldn't. It's about uh, the effective basis to do so. And there's a very much a big spectrum for AI. Uh, I always love a kind of two by two mat matrix and we have one here. Uh, we have autonomy of decision making along the bottom and we have sophistication of machine learning algorithm on the, on the Y axis. And you might already kind of naturally gravitate to one of these areas over the other. Uh, we might hear more today. You might actually discover for yourself that there's a part on this on this kind of grid that suits you best. And over on the top right, that's really kind of the AI advocates. So here we have our cutting edge AI machine learning algorithms that trigger real time actions. So this might be things like a virtual front door that will ask a few automated questions, start a conversation, but then automatically trigger a response based on that. Bottom right, we might have that kind of credit card example I've already used, um, triggers an action, but it's based on simple rules. And if there's any kind of uh, inconclusivity, it may then refer on to a human. Uh, bottom left, personally, I don't like this, but this is every action from start to finish being entirely manual. Um, doesn't necessarily mean pen and paper, but everything we would do as an organization would ever have to be done from scratch, right through to end by human, every time from start to finish and repeat. Uh, and then we have lots of things here in between. So right in the middle is kind of how a data analytics professional might operate. So it uses these methods like the food for five machine learning or regression analysis, how it was called kind of 10 years ago. Um, we'll use those methods to help inform professionals. So giving people with the information, but keeping a human in the loop. Right. So that's a bit of a recap and introduction. Now we're going to get into a bit of a mini exercise. I'm going to introduce kind of a few AI concepts to you one at a time. Um, I'll give you a bit of information to kind of get your thoughts churning. Uh, sometimes I'm going to be deliberately kind of provocative slash antagonistic. Uh, but this is a safe space and you're welcome to have completely opposite views to myself and anyone else around you. Um, we're going to capture some components which are good and bad on whiteboard, which I'll flash up at the end. Um, and my colleagues, a senior analyst in the team, uh, Alice and Katie, are going to have a look through those whiteboards and try and pick out some emerging themes at each stage. Uh, and this is the first one. And there's no better place to start with uh, rather than the extreme end of the spectrum. So this is the thing that uh, no one's really said is coming, but everyone seems to be a bit fearful of. We've had a few mentions of killer robots already, or just robots in general. So introducing the brilliantly efficient robotic, therapeutic and healthcare assistant, or Bertha for short, or also known as the robot social care worker. Um, now, 
Burfa has been built to serve as a personal healthcare assistant. It is able to determine long term health and care needs of individuals through simple observations and interactions. So it can assess and diagnose. It can also identify immediate urgent needs such as a fall and actually take action that ensures the individual can get the support they need as soon as possible. For all the carees, vital health statistics are tracked in a non-obtrusive way and they are monitored to ensure that their support evolves to be as on point as possible. Right, we are now going to flash over to a whiteboard now. So hopefully I can do this as slick as possible. And I want you to tell me on this whiteboard, use the kind of uh, post-it notes, what you don't like about this and what you do like about it. So get into the very nitty gritty details. Bear with me one second while I try and do this as slick as possible. Let's bring up a whiteboard. There we go. It's coming, it's coming. No, no, you're not self driving car, not yet. Right, let's go. No, let's get up our. There we go, a bit of a preview for what comes next. So, hopefully, you should be able to see that now. Um, do start kind of jotting down your thoughts on that whiteboard. If it's struggling for you, then please feel free to use the chat function instead. Um, I'm going to stress now, though, this isn't something I'm proposing myself. But tell me the details, tell me the nitty gritty details of what you think is really good about this idea, what the components you think are good, but then also what are the specific specificities of what you do not like. And whilst you get started, I'm going to kind of give you a bit more material with a bit with additional food for thought. Now, first up, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with um, Sophia. So Sophia was a conversational AI robot that joked that it wanted to kill all humans, or destroy all humans, I think were the exact words that it used. I'm gonna drop the picture of Sophia into the chat. Now, so Sophia is straight out of that kind of uncanny valley. Now, forgetting about the kind of nightmarish uh, robots and that dystopian future of kind of uh, six foot tall Terminator style robots and the cutting edge engineering, but let's focus on the AI instead. Um, just, uh, just checking, I'm not sure if people are having problems accessing the whiteboard. It sounds like some people have got that there. Um, I'll leave that in a second with hands and my facilitators to help you with that uh, as I kind of continue here. But it looks like you've got some good comments coming in. Um, so thinking about kind of the artificial intelligence underneath these kind of, um, uh, I guess, healthcare. Uh, professional assistance. Um, what if instead of this six foot tall, uh, beautifully engineered robot, we are actually looking at the same functionality but in a smaller shell, but something a lot less uh, obtrusive in your household. So something maybe you could wear around your neck or your wrist. Um, so all of the things in the description I gave earlier, all starts, uh, uh, all, all exist as assistive technology devices or smart devices. All of that functionality of being able to monitor statistics, of being able to uh, uh, notice if there's been a fall, that technology really exists. And a report earlier this year estimated that technology-enabled care could save the NHS £200 million per year. And these can be simple solutions. They don't have to be hugely sophisticated. It could be as simple as a, a kind of full pendant worn around the neck, for example. So if you take away that kind of big robot shell, a few well-placed sensors around the home that you needn't even notice could also monitor your house health. Uh, on top of this, numerous research from the likes of uh, Institute for Cancer Research found that AI is better than a biopsy at detecting some forms of cancer, so quite good at diagnosis as well in some instances. And again, it doesn't have to automatically trigger anything, it's giving the information to a professional. Uh, and AI processing visual imagery uh, it's proven to be quite a good diagnosis tool. Um, so it looks like some kind of good comments starting to come up there as well. Um, I'm going to give one other quick example. It's one we heard about earlier. Um, so it's not just about this kind of uh, healthcare assistant itself, but it's the AI technologies that might support health and care professionals. So while some of the comments look like they're starting to allude to 
uh, the, the, the requirement for human interaction in, in the health and care profession. Um, there are elements of health and care roles that are not particularly good use of the health and care professional's expertise. And these are things like writing up case notes, uh, reading through masses of uh, literature, for example. And uh, a social care survey found that more than 50% of the social worker's time is spent writing up notes. Uh, clinicians spend a third of their time trying to keep up to date with relevant literature. It's always evolving. Um, now, Perth, or the robot social worker, could theoretically access all existing literature and draw upon relevant information instantly. Um, likewise, kind of all observations, interactions, conversations and so on could be automatically written up and summarised or analysed. And again, these kind of technologies exist and we use them in other practices. But is there an application here we can get on board within the health and care sector? Uh, for those in the, the previous session, I think Eddie from Lottie used an example of exactly this. And I think it was uh, London Borough of Kingston um, that are looking at ways of kind of almost recording the interaction that a professional is having with someone they're kind of uh, assessing or, 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 or working with. And it can automatically kind of type up and almost summarise that information. Right. So I think we're going to start to wrap up this section. Um, I'm going to come to. Alice and Katie to see if they see, notice any consistent themes on uh, let's start on the let's start on the positive side. So Alice, any consistent themes you see emerging here? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think some of the main things is that we uh, see the immediacy of the care with this. Um, the, the care is constant and is available 24 seven and no breaks are needed. It's able to give unbiased care um, and the opportunity for human error has been removed. Um, it may also be more cost effective than paying someone for 24 hour care um, and also able to process a lot of data and give a complete overview all in one go um, and could also be seen as a companion. Nice, nice. And um, Katie, I've, I've asked you to be the cold water and uh, tell me, tell us what kind of concerns are arising on the what's not so good about this side. Yes, so um, the biggest one, I think, is that, you know, the doubt that the robot will be able to comprehend and capture uh, the complexity of human emotion. Um, and then there's a risk, obviously, of lack of empathy as a result um, when making decisions. Um, we've also got um, that uh, it is, it's likely to not be able to fully tackle that social isolation element. And actually, you know, humans need other humans uh, uh, for personable interactions um, and actually can result in further isolation. Um, and then finally, uh, we've got a theme coming out of one size doesn't fit all. Um, and there's a real risk that the, the robot uh, is unable to kind of tailor um, care experiences um, um, as a human would um, based on the complexities of each individual. Lovely, thank you. And I think, yeah, that one size fits all will be like a consistent theme throughout, I'd imagine, uh, in that for all these types of technologies, um, what works for someone might not necessarily work for someone else. Right, so uh, returning back to the slides, hopefully you should see on the screen now, um, the first thing we just talked about is deliberately provocative scenario, um, but there were some common themes starting to emerge, so it's fantastic. Uh, I think one key skill and the health and care sector is what you're seeing on the screen now, emotional intelligence. Um, it's really imperative that people and organisations delivering the support have empathy, resilience, social skills, communication skills, and many other kind of probably, dare I say it, kind of human characteristics. Uh, and they need those in order to act and respond and provide quality care. Because giving care kind of intrinsically feels like a human to human act. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, there's certainly some good components we've collectively identified there as well, which is really, really great to see. Um, a quote I kind of dumped in the chat of the previous session was from the guy called Amit Ray, who's a bit of a spiritual guru, uh, especially when it comes to kind of AI as well. Um, but he said, as more and more artificial intelligence is entering into the world, more and more emotional intelligence must enter into leadership. So uh, I've got a bit of a grid here that we're trying to summarise some of this thinking into on uh, things we think humans are best at, things we think AI can help with. Um, so typically the biggest concern people raise when debating AI is AI making complex decisions about humans 
instead of humans. It doesn't matter how powerful and sophisticated and accurate the algorithms might be, human professionals should be making decisions about humans wherever humanly possible. Um, maybe that thinking might change in the future, but it's probably fair to capture this here under the things we think humans are best at being human. Uh, but we also found quite a lot of things that we potentially feel, think could be quite useful. So some of this is about AI's potential to process vast quantities of information to give frontline professionals with the best, most timely information possible. Some is to try and create efficiencies in some of the admin that health and care workers find to dominate their week and provide that time for caring. Uh, and so we'll start to get a bit of a clearer picture of some of that kind of everyday AI, AI uh, that you might have heard about earlier. So things which are perhaps on a kind of lower scale, but potentially much more useful. Right, we're going to move on to the next one. So we're going from uh, care to car. And the second AI poster boy, the self-driving car. So um, we're no longer talking about AI making emotional judgments about vulnerable humans. We've kind of almost said that, that that's a role for a human. Um, but driving technically isn't a human to human relationship. It's car to road. Um, yes, there are humans in cars, but you don't directly engage emotionally with other cars and drivers unless you're kind of um, doing healthy bouts of road rage. So this is all fine, maybe, or is it? Who knows? Uh, introducing the, the kind of self-driving car. So very quickly before I flash over to our second whiteboard, where is the world with this right now? So we used the word spectrum a few times already, and once again, I'm going to talk about spectrum. Um, there are levels of autonomy in all vehicles, and those levels go from level zero to level five. So level zero is no automation whatsoever. Uh, level one, things that you might be used to, things like cruise control, for example. Level two, self-driving cars can handle some throttle and steering um, and can park themselves as well, actually. Uh, but you're expected to remain vigilant at all times as if you were driving a level zero car. So, yes, it can do some loop maneuvers, but you need to be able to be physically controlled all the time. Uh, level three cars would let you take your eyes off the road in designated areas only. Level four is where a car can take over in the event of emergency and get you to safety. Uh, level five would be absolutely no limitations whatsoever and can effectively self-drive anywhere a human could. So at the moment, the existing vehicles, when we're talking about self-driving cars in the world, are predominantly level two, where there's no switching off at the wheel by the driver. But within the next 10 to 15 years, it is highly probable and expected even that those level four and five automated vehicles will exist commercially. So I'm asking you, as we flash over to our next whiteboard, what is good about that and what is bad about that? So thinking about level four and five cars, as I pull up my next whiteboard, um, I'm talking about kind of a car where theoretically you could get into um, just type in a destination and then just lay back, sit back, do whatever you like, uh, play games, read books, whatever, until you arrive. Um, so let me open our second whiteboard. That's our self-driving car. Here we go. So, yes. Again, please do feel free to start dropping your comments in there. What is good? What is bad? If the, if the whiteboards aren't working for you, then please do use the chat as well. Uh, what as many kind of few points as possible. But once again, it's those specific details which I'm interested in. What are the things that, which are good here uh, and have potential and what are the things which are not so good or a cause for concern? And once again, I'm going to be uh, <laughs> deliberately annoying and give you spoken material as we go through. Um, and that first one, the first kind of additional kind of information I want to give is around road safety. It's obviously a big issue. Now, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration found that human error is the reason for 94% of crashes, which is quite staggering. 94% of crashes. This is worldwide. Um, evidently, in, in Britain, we're either better drivers or have worse infrastructure. But apparently in Britain, slightly more conservative, 71% of crashes are uh, a result of human error. Um, so it's estimated by McKinsey that autonomous vehicles will reduce accidents by 90%. And whilst I say that, I'm gonna drop the link in the chat there. So 90% reduction in serious um, injuries, either killed or seriously injured, which is quite staggering. So 
as well as potential for saving lives there. There could be considerably better traffic efficiency, perhaps, um, better impact on the environment. Um, I think we, in the article, offer some extent as well. The cost benefits alone on society sums up to around £800 billion per year that could be spent elsewhere. So significant outcomes could be different with functioning self-driving vehicles. Um, I'm just going to have a quick peruse of the chat, whilst, or sorry, of the whiteboard, whilst I uh, see what other comments are coming in. And again, some fantastic themes that are starting to come out, which is great. Um, right, my second prompt, and again, being a bit antagonistic, um, is about morality in the moral dilemma. I'm sure there are probably some motorcyclists in this kind of virtual room. Um, I'll get to why I'm, I'm asking that in a minute. But um, self-driving cars have raised some moral dilemmas in their testing. Because, after all, a vehicle is capable of killing and seriously injuring people. It can almost be seen as a weapon. So, even if accidents are reduced by 90%, there will come a scenario whereby a self-driving car faces a situation whereby it has to select an undesirable outcome. There's no positive outcomes here. It has to select one of the above. So it can do nothing and hit the car in front. It can veer left and hit a pedestrian, or it can veer right and drive off a bridge into a lake, or various permutations of that sort of thing. Um, now, in the initial testing, when presented with a scenario, hit the motorbike or hit the car, it hit the motorbike every time. It kind of calculated that two cars colliding with an average of, let's say, five people in each out of a 25% chance of death um, represents a worse outcome than hitting the single motorcyclist that has a 95% chance of death. Now. Obviously, the point of testing is to then try and circumnavigate kind of real world challenges like this. Um, there's actually a game that people around the world are playing, which is called How Not to Get Hit by a Self-Driving Car. And I'll drop that in as well, but this is to help train the kind of AI and improve the development of self-driving cars. Um, essentially, it's um, AI has learned to detect a bike and someone riding a bike. But what about if it's a, a tandem bike? or um, a penny farthing, because there will definitely be people riding around Shoreditch on a penny farthing. Um, will it detect that because it's not quite the, the norm? Likewise, will it detect someone in a, in a fancy dress costume? So this game is what people have been playing. They're trying to trick the AI into not recognise them, and they're tricking a car into hitting them. Um, and it all helps with the training of AI, much like uh, everyone in this room would have been helping train Google's visual imagery kind of AI, where uh, for the last kind of couple of decades even, those things where it says select all the traffic lights in the picture. Right, uh, I think we're drawing to a natural conclusion on self-driving cars, but before just parking this entirely, uh, I'm going to end with something that's particularly antagonistic. So it's based on those two things I've just told you about. So in England, 30,000 people killed or seriously injured on the UK roads each year through good old fashioned human error. If the um, kind of rollout of artificial, sorry, of, of um, uh, self-driving cars was uh, effective and we could reduce that by 90%, that's 3,000 people killed or seriously injured. But an algorithm is deciding who lives and dies. So what is better there? 30,000 people die because of human error or 3,000 people, but where an algorithm decides who lives and dies. Um, and again, obviously, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's never a binary choice. There's we something in between, but would you potentially feel differently if someone you knew was in that 3,000 or someone you knew was in that 30,000? And again, <laughs> I don't have any strong opinions here. Uh, I'm happy to ask some questions. Uh, but there we go. I'm going to wrap up that now, and I'm going to come over to um, let's go come to Katie first this time. Any emerging patterns you've noticed from this second whiteboard? Yes, quite a few uh, emerging patterns at the moment um, on the kind of negative side of self-driving cars. Um, firstly, uh, we've got uh, something about the cost um, of, uh, of, of those self-driving cars. So software updates, will your car shut down if you don't pay, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and that level of, of cost could increase with self-driving cars. 
um, quite a lot um, of people are saying that it takes the fun away from driving. So that human element again, that 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 human emotion that's attached to things that bring us joy, um, you're going to take that away. Uh, you're going to take away the joy that many humans feel whilst driving. Um, and then finally, um, we've got a couple of things about safety. So uh, safety, particularly from humans. Um, Self-driving cars uh, might uh, need, well, will need to interact with human driving cars. Um, and as we know, humans uh, are unpredictable um, and that could cause some problems there and some safety issues. And finally, um, we've got the argument that's quite, uh, that's often a bit uh, in the press is uh, uh, accidents and responsibility. So who takes responsibility uh, for an accident that might happen with a self-driving car? Um, is it the car's fault or is it the human's fault? Um, it just creates a bit of uh, murky water there. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Aleph, anything you saw kind of emerging from the what's good about this idea side? So a lot of mention about um, how this may be safer with reduced accidents, um, safer for multiple reasons, things like um, keeping to speed limits, um, driving with care and using things like indicators, um, and also response in terms of hazards, but also things inside the car. So a car won't just get distracted by children crying, for example. Um, a lot of people are hoping that this will reduce car insurance. Um, it can also save people time and people can also complete other tasks while they are commuting. Um, and also may give more uh, freedom to people who are unable to drive. Um, so things people who have may have medical issues where they can't drive, for example. Lovely, thank you. I think there's some good kind of comments in the chat once again. Uh, I like the one, when does it stop becoming a car and more of a uh, transport robot? Um, and yeah, I think the kind of questions I was posing there was deliberately about that kind of trolley problem around ethics and um, morality. And uh, I guess we could almost have a session exclusively on uh, morality and ethics. And I think there even is one tomorrow, I believe, and you'll still be able to sign up. Um, so yeah, lots of fantastic comments once again, and some kind of clear patterns emerging. They're quite similar to many of the pros and cons lists that people have been pondering for uh, the last decade or so in regards to self-driving vehicles. Um, I guess my kind of rhetorical question here was, who would you want making morality-based judgments um, in a scenario that needs this kind of split-second choice? Does it matter that a machine could probably do it a bit quicker in terms of selecting the optimal outcome? But that optimal outcome is based on the definition that's been given. Uh, or maybe that's what a human kind of is innately doing anyway. So uh, like with kind of emotional intelligence, this is another area that generally people are a bit uncomfortable with, the divisions that have elements of moral judgment. I'm not going to try and kind of unpick the brains of that. That's going to happen a lot over the next few years. Uh, but I think in some situations, suboptimal outcomes are potentially tolerable as long as there is that accountability. I think someone mentioned that, I saw that a few times on the whiteboard, accountability. Who gets held to account if AI is making a decision? Um, so I'm gonna stick that on the, the left-hand side now. Again, thought the thinking might change on that, uh, but we're taking away decisions requiring moral judgment from machines. But on the right-hand side, we found a few more things that we have found that could be quite useful and definitely potential there for improving outcomes. In particular here, we're talking about kind of safety um, and other things as well. Um, I guess on a less sensitive topic, AI technologies and things like the Internet of Things are looking to make our cities smarter. So AI dri driven traffic management is being used uh, globally. Uh, the smart parking, which directs your vehicles to parking spots, all things like that, smart bean collection, things can make a kind of more um, kind of improved infrastructure. It doesn't have to just be this kind of all singing or dancing uh, self-driving car. Right, um, so we've said no to human on human decision making. We've said no to anything where there's moral ambiguity. Uh, and now we've arrived at content creation. And this has been um, probably the main reason why we've been having these discussions over the course of the last year. There's always been this natural interest in robots and self-driving cars, but generative AI tools has really been what's accelerated the everyman interest in AI and kind of put some of these tools in the fingertips of everyone. So uh, introducing here, all generative AI. So here we're gonna talk about 
uh, ChatGPT. So we've got sort of Dali, Bard, Synthesia, all of those things all wrapped together. Uh, so it's my quick kind of sales pitch. I've got a strategy to write about emerging health challenges and the deadlines tomorrow. It's got your back. Someone sent you a 200 page business case to read, but you don't have time to do so. Don't write about it. Um, need a picture of Donald Trump as a Nirvana baby for some reason. It can do that absolutely easy. If you know how to ask the right question, you may never need to use your brain again. It's brilliant, or maybe not. Um, so these types of tools have accelerated so fast. Uh, and in fact, there is kind of belief that the next version of ChatGPT will achieve artificial general intelligence. So when I'm asking you this next question, we go to our next whiteboard, I want you to envisage maybe the near future versions of these sorts of tools, and maybe even a hybrid of them all together. Uh, so if you're not familiar with some of the things I mentioned, uh, ChatGPT is a large language model. You can kind of ask anything really and it will give you an answer. Dali creates images like the one on your screen. Uh, Bard is another large language model designed as a conversational tool. Uh, Synthesia creates videos based on the, the information you give it. So the question is, if I wanted to create a marketing strategy for a new healthy eating campaign, I just feed a bit of information, a bit of data, some aims, all into this tool, and hey presto, I'm gonna get a strategy based on evidence and some branding and a commercial video, so it's all to use within minutes. So what's good about that and what is not so good about that? The all-encompassing, do everything for you, generative tool, and let me bring up my third whiteboard. Might be a second. And yeah, get thinking about kind of what are the AI products which we're going to kind of see over the next few years. So at the minute, I guess, kind of AI, generative AI, is that that, um, I guess, the internet stage of Ask Jeeves and Alta Vista and Hotmail.com. Um, realistically, we may be looking at some of these things like ChatGPT and Dali in a few years time and laugh at them because they've been superseded by something a lot more slick and a lot more incredible. But um, yeah. Here we go, you should see a whiteboard on your screen now. If it's a small one, let's see if I can make that a bit bigger. And once again, tell me what you think is good about that and what is bad. Use the chat if the whiteboards aren't working for you and I'll try and keep an eye on both of those. So, while you are doing that, once again, a little bit of prompt material. Um, so, I guess the world tends to focus on misuse of these tools quite often, it makes it a much more interesting story um, where there have been misuse of these tools, but there are quite a lot of them. Um, but bad examples include creating deep fakes, uh, fake news stories that spread information and concern. Um, there's another case as well of a, an attorney that presented evidence of historic cases to support their own case in court, only to latterly find that ChatGPT had made up those historic cases they weren't in fact real. Um, I'd probably say that is more of a human error than a lot of these things are. So there's concern though, general concern and warranted concern that it has been and can be used for phishing attacks. It can create convincing fake content for kind of phishing purposes and also potentially to create malware or determine kind of most passwords to be honest as well. So again, you might make the argument that actually the thing behind this is humans misusing the tool. So potentially like blaming the gun instead of the shooter, but if the tools weren't there to misuse, then there wouldn't be any misusage. So again, I'm seeing some kind of good comments coming into the chat. Um, I'll quickly give my kind of last example here. Um, but that's the kind of tools themselves. So thinking specifically about the ask I gave you, if I wanted to just click a few buttons, feed a few inputs in and get my healthy eating marketing campaign, I'm delegating it all to generative AI. Um, what's gonna, what's not gonna be good with the final output? Um, now, I asked generative AI, like ChatGPT, to come up for a title for this uh, data talk session and for a few other data talk sessions as well. And I wanted a really clever, maybe some kind of like AI pun in there somewhere, but it wasn't very good. It sucked even, it's not, wasn't great at giving any kind of creative suggestions. And generally kind of machine learning models, their outputs are based on what they are trained on. 
and what they're trained on are usually things that have already happened before. Therefore, it's great telling you what has already happened, but potentially limited when it comes to thinking differently, being creative. Um, I don't know if anyone else um, thinks or had similar experience with there, in that if you give it an instruction, it can get a pretty good um, output on that instruction. But I don't feel the best at creative outputs, but others may think differently. Um, I'll give another few seconds for people to kind of jot down their thinking here. Um, but if I, okay, I'm going to come over, I'm going to start asking people to thumb of these boards now. So I'll come to uh, Alice first this time. What other persistent kind of positive themes emerging here? Um, so a lot of people are mentioning how it can save time. It can also save a lot of money. It also can be a bit of fun if it's kept harmless. Um, sometimes um, does it matter if art was created by AI if you like the art? Um, they're the main themes that I can see. Nice, good good question to pose there. And yeah, very much a, a bit in that camp of, I use it as a bit of a co-translator as well, which is always really, really helpful. Um, Katie, what's the, the less good examples people are kind of capturing? Yeah, so we've got quite a few here. Um, we firstly got um, the idea that you mentioned, Stephen, about kind of fake information um, being spread online. Not only is that misleading, but it could be dangerous, um, could be used for malware phishing, as you mentioned. Um, the second key theme is around job losses, uh, especially in the social media and marketing sector. Um, and then uh, a lot of uh, talk about kind of the loss of human creativity um, and that could cause kind of detrimental levels of dependence um, on, 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 on AI um, when actually uh, if we use it creativity is, is limited to existing ideas um, and doesn't give scope for kind of future uh, creativity and future, um, future ideas there um, and also uh, finally um, it can reduce the quality of the content. Um, there's a risk there that uh, the content will not be uh, as quality assured um, as if the human would be doing it. So, um, yeah. Lovely, thank you. And I, I think um, it'd be interesting to see the continued development of these types of uh, AI tools and technologies, because uh, as I kind of mentioned, it's the early days of them, theoretically in their entire kind of life cycle. And um, yes, ChatGPT might be the, the ask Jeeves to a future Google search or whatever they may be. Um, I guess here it's fair to say though that it's probably not quite as sensitive a subject as emotional intelligence and morality, um, but creativity is perhaps one that's probably more pertinent to be asking questions about at this point in time. Um, I kind of particularly think this question isn't quite so black and white and there's a lot of grey around when and where to use these types of tools. So. I think here, based on kind of what's been captured, we mostly don't like uh, the scenario whereby these tools are a replacement for human creative thinking. And at the minute, we don't even think that is actually possible. It doesn't really give often that kind of creative outputs. Uh, but certainly they can help fuel creativity, which is fantastic. I think lots of people have had great enjoyment from these tools. They have helped work when used appropriately. Um, and a great quote that I like here is, um, AI won't replace you, but someone that knows how to use it may well in the future. So I think knowing about these tools and appropriate kind of usage is really, really important as they accelerate in their development. So final, final, final whiteboard coming up. We, what about when we don't want our responses to be creative? We want them to be black and white or factual. And that's what you might want from a chatbot. Um, yes, chatbots have uh, been annoying everyone for decades now. Uh, often you might not even realise you've been talking to one, um, but chatbots have become a staple of most successful organisations. Uh, the front door to a lot of companies is now virtual. So if you have a question, chances are someone has asked that question before, and those historic events can be used to answer your question without ever having to burden the ears of a real human being. So it doesn't matter if your question is slightly different, it will try again and again and again. The chatbots don't need to sleep. Uh, you can't wear a chatbot down until it gets its manager. Uh, and believe me, I've tried on that one. Um, however, are most questions really that nuanced? 
are most of the contacts that you see just about kind of let's say a pothole outside uh, their houses so surely a uh, kind of super chatbot can ensure the bulk of contacts we have are directed to where they need to be in an instant so this is my final question on our final whiteboard um, and again I'm going to propose a really deliberately provocative scenario and this isn't one I'm proposing in real life this is just to kind of get your uh, views so I'm going to get rid of all human man front doors across every government organisation, both local and central. So all telephone lines gone, all email addresses on, on the internet sites gone. I'm going to barricade the doors to all physical premises to stop people coming in to ask me a question in person. And I'm going to replace all of that with a single front door chatbot that acts as first contact for everyone. My hope is that it can answer 80% of questions and get the right people the right information immediately and just the other 20 percent will signpost to someone a human that can deal with their um, challenges so my question now as i flash over to our fur uh, sorry fourth and final whiteboard is what is good about that scenario and again specifically that everything is uh, every front door is a, a chatbot scenario um, what is good about that what is bad about that and bear with me a second if you bring up the final whiteboard and then we will wrap up. Chatbot, here we go. So, should see that now. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you again. There we go, and get started. I've in the whiteboard, I appreciate that everyone's been able to access these. Um, drop in the chat if not. Um, and yeah, we'll start harvesting your views on the uh, the all singing, all dancing front door. A uh, couple of little prompts for you just to end with. Uh, so apparently, uh, a few survey links I can send you as well. 87% of customers report that chatbots are effective at resolving their issues. So 87% say a chatbot has helped them, um, which like, it's staggering to me because I feel like uh, of all the things we covered, this is more, perhaps one of the most far-fetched um, I must always just be in the other 13% where a chatbot can't resolve my issues. Um, a different piece of research uh, found that 86% of people would, however, prefer to speak to a human. And again, kind of almost going back to that thing we covered at the start there, uh, human interactions. Um, but also it's the inflexibility of a chatbot, um, not being able to react to new uh, situations. Um, Sometimes people feel they get stuck in this infuriating loop where the AI can't adapt to new information or new situations that they've never come across before. Just a final little nugget on this one, which again, uh, those in the previous session would have heard about Air Canada, who um, quite recently got taken to court because its chatbot gave incorrect information. So it told someone they were entitled to a refund when in fact they weren't. And then uh, Air Canada's defence, um, they didn't want to pay that refund because they said the chatbot is liable for its own actions. Um, but thankfully, that was uh, thrown out of court and they, they did have to pay that refund because the chatbot shouldn't be liable, have the accountability for its own actions. Um, again, uh, let me drop that link into the chat because that's an interesting one. There we go. Right. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so we're going to... We're going to, yeah, let's wrap up this one now and we'll come over to uh, Alice one last time. But what are the good things about chatbots? So again, we've got, it saves time, it saves money. Um, it also reduces the need for repetitive and easy tasks for people. So people can actually focus on the more complex issues. Um, it's available 24-7. And it may reduce discrimination barriers um, and also the same questions will also get the same answers so people won't be treated differently. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Katie, anything we're not so keen on as a group? Yeah, I think three main three, three main things here. Um, the first, uh, first one is the loop, the idea of an endless loop that you brought up, Stephen. Um, and then if the customer, which is obviously very frustrating, and if that frustrated customer then goes on to speak to someone, they would be even more frustrated uh, than they were if they were just able to speak to someone to resolve their problem. Um, second one, quite a big one, is that uh, there's 
really a, a large potential for discrimination against particular groups, so the elderly um, and disabled groups as well. Um, and then finally, it's again that lack of empathy and understanding for people's uh, real-time issues. Lovely, thank you. And again, uh, some similar themes keep cropping up, which is great. And I think it echoes a lot of the thinking across the, the world, really, of what is happening at the moment on AI and AI technologies. And there's elements there which are a little bit contradictory, though, in that we've previously said we want our AI to answer simple questions and not be creative. But then also we get annoyed when it gets stuck in that uh, rigid robotic responses and it's not being creative or adapting. Um, but I guess we're starting to get a good picture of the type of AI we want in our lives right now. Um, and here it is. There we go. Um, we've solved it. I don't know what all the fucking controversy is about. We want AI doing these stuck things on the left. We don't want AI doing some of these. Also, we don't want AI doing some of the things on the left. Certainly not at this point in time. But we do and are happy with it doing some of these things that are on the right. Now, as a quick, quick summary, uh, people in the public sector are still really determining how to appropriately, proportionately and ethically use artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence technologies. But our collective thinking today kind of mostly resembles where people are landing at this point in time. So I would say as an additional point, realistically, whoever we work for, whoever we're representing today, we can't really dictate the pace of the rollout at a local level. And that might sound scary, uh, but kind of taking the stance of kind of digging the hills and saying, we mustn't do this, or we must think about that first, or we must stop and do this. Um, realistically, the rest of the world isn't going to stop and wait for us. Um, and that can sometimes leave organisations ill-prepared and behind. So it's fantastic that uh, you heard Gavin talking about the uh, AI uh, jeans and jumpers session with his cabinet earlier, because it's important to stay abreast of in, uh, emerging information and then evolve as that information evolves as well. Um, one last look at the things I've circled here on the right. Um, effectively, this might fall under that bracket of robotic process automation that I mentioned earlier, uh, typically a starting point for a lot of organisations, simple automation of logic or rules based actions. Um, and I'll end myself with one quote from Sabine Howard, which I'm probably murdered her name there, but she's a professor of engineering at Bristol Robotics. And uh, she says robots are not going to replace humans, they're going to make their jobs much more humane. The difficult, demeaning, demanding, dangerous and dull jobs these are the jobs that robots and AI will be taking. And I'm going to pass you over now to Ben. <laughs> to two minutes to wrap up, I'm afraid, Ben. Uh, but thank you all for your input today. No trouble. Thank you, folks. Really fun and engaging session. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to wrap up and avoid just giving you my my opinions. But I thought a few a couple of reflections that might just help in terms of, well, goodness me, what do we do then? How do we start to kind of explore this stuff well? Um, I think the point that was made earlier that, that today's kind of AI apps are not necessarily the ones that are going to exist in the future, right? So when when Web 2.0 came along, stuff like Friends Reunited, MySpace, you know, none of these things exist anymore. Um, but the kind of underlying principle of a more social web has stuck around and has continued to be a thing. So I think we can expect to see um, increasing development. Goodness me, I hope it's not just chatbots forever. You know, I don't think they're the best way of engaging, certainly with public services. Um, but I think if we can think more carefully about the outcome that maybe we're trying to get across. So, you know, more personalized, more interactive, more nuanced service delivery through AI, fantastic outcome to chase after. Let's stay focused on that. Let's really think about how we deliver what our service users and our organizations need uh, rather than rushing to kind of bang chatbots in all over the place or deploy some new technology just for the sake of it. Um, my last reflection really was kind of looking back over the last 20 or so years, I've been kind of working in, in the digital services space. And we as a sector were really behind the curve with the Internet. And for me, that's the big risk here is that we don't get ahead of this particular curve and we find ourselves in a similar position again. Um, so let's get out ahead of this. Let's really think about what it is we're trying to do. Let's involve real people in the development and the design of these things so that we avoid the things that Jess pointed out in the chat around excluding our most vulnerable users. Um, let's prototype. Let's try things. Let's really test and understand whether it's delivering the kind of service outcomes we want to see. Um, so yeah, test, get out, play with this stuff, iterate, think about it carefully in the context of your services. Um, but for me, I think this is one of these waves that we're going to have to ride, um, and it's not something to be scared of.
Uh, but yeah, super fun session. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the kind of data talk sessions along the way. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers.